Okay, uh, we are on the last little chunk of uh, the neuroanatomy brain unit. Uh, neurochemistry, bio... The biology stuff that's not genes. So that's what we're going to do today. And, um... Yeah, so let's get started. We're talking about hormones. Last time, we talked about neurotransmitters and neurons and all of those nice sciencey things. Uh, but this time, we're going to still talk about those nice sciencey things. But, uh, yeah, so hormones. Let's let's get started. Okay, so the big two hormones. Now, obviously, I, there are tons, tons and tons of these. But we're going to focus on a couple primarily uh mostly uh epinephrine which is also known as adrenaline um and like depending on if you're european or not uh it'll be adrenaline or epinephrine so uh essentially this is the adrenaline one um <laughs> sorry ramble uh as it's referred to throughout the book and norepinephrine and so uh, so norepinephrine is mostly in the brain, while epinephrine and adrenaline is mostly in the body. Uh, both of these hormones are um, used to create that fight or flight response. Uh, that uh, that cutesy little like two Fs. Uh, there's a third F. Uh, so you also have freeze, which is uh, another aspect. So it's not just fight or flight; it's fight, flight, or freeze. And the brain is fully alert and concentrated on the th on the threat in uh, these scenarios. Now, uh, this this literature is um how do I say this nicely? A little sexist. Um, and I. But here's at least it's it's another framing uh, that women from an ev and this is like an evolutionary psych. Framing, um, I think I have a nice little, yeah, uh, this this little uh, pop up here of maybe. Uh, it's okay. So let me let me back up and tell you what it is before you get a sense of what my opinion could possibly be. So uh, there's possibly this response that women have, contrary to um, men, of this tendency towards tendon a friend. And so in the face of a threat, threat, the idea is that they calm others down and get people to work together as a way to approach that threat. This is based on evolutionary theory. And we will have, we will get to experience my many, many strong um, opinions on this in the evolutionary psych unit. That is not the next one, which is behavior genetics, but the one after that. Um, so yeah, this is based on evolutionary theory where this is, the idea is that women have this additional aspect that they, they can't really flee because, uh, they have children to protect. So the fight or flight response leaves the kids kind of out to fend for themselves. So either you fl you flee, so the kids left behind, or you fight and sure you might win, but you might also lose in the fight situation, leaving your kids to fend for themselves. Um, yeah, and so this this finding seems to be linked to oxytocin, uh, which it seems to promote nurturant and uh, sociable behaviors, relaxa improves relaxation and reduction of fear. It uh, decreases anxiety as well as, at least in mothers to their children increases attachment. Um, now these three kind of, or four, I guess, tend to befriend fight, flight, or freeze are only the initial and kind of automatic responses to stress or threats. So the behavior, like behaviors, like after that, like instant, like firing of hormones um, are not constrained to this response. So like, you're not stuck there. That's just Another, like the automatic response, I, I almost like to characterize as instinct. Like that's your instinct. That's what, what happens immediately. But then you turn back on your humanity and aren't just like reacting. Um, like with your, now 
it's not a lizard brain, but that's kind of the phrase I think of with like instinct is like, just like it, it shoots out before you have any conscious processing. Like lizard brain is running. Not that lizard brain is a thing, but like just to kind of think about like a multi-stage approach. So this is just like initial reactions and that's where hormones come into play. Now, in addition to um, oxy or uh, oxytocin and uh, norepinephrine and epinephrine, we have testosterone. And there's a lot of debate on this. So here's what, here are the facts. So concentrations of testosterone are about 10 times higher in men than women. Uh, there seems to be some kind of link to aggression, but it's not straightforward. It's not complex. It, it is complex. It might play a role in control and inhibition of uh, aggression as well as sexuality. So, it, but it's also related to a ton of other behaviors. And I'm going to crawl more deeply into this, but these are kind of the key bullet points, which is why they're, they're on the slide. And the cause of direction here is not known. Uh, we have not established that it's like testosterone causing aggression or aggression causing testosterone. Um, and so let me back up and kind of crawl more deeply into this. So when I say the link to aggression is complex, that's an understatement. So some studies have found that those with higher levels of testosterone are more prone to aggression and behavioral control problems and it seems to be linked in some way to criminal behavior, such as assault and drug use and um, avoidance, dominance and loneliness. But that doesn't mean that men with high T, high testosterone are always aggressive. Like it's, it's not deterministic. There seems to be, at least when we look at steroid users who have like way higher levels of testosterone by their own goal, <laughs> Um, they seem to have uh, increased aggression and like increased sexual urges, stuff like that. But this is also related to tons of other behaviors. And I've got a list here that I'll keep listing until I get bored, where you do. Hopefully you'll get bored first. No, I'll get bored. Eh. Anyway, so yeah, so this is related to sociability, impulsivity, lower inhibition, so high T, low inhibition, so low T, more inhibition, and conformity. So in women, um, it seems to be linked with unprovoked violent crime, sexual interest and desire, but the direction is not clear on what's happening in, in all likelihood. It's, it's going back and forth. It's not like just one nice causal direction. Um, so like, Testosterone seems to increase, uh, like among fans of the winning soccer team, according to the study. Um, so, team win. So they measured before and after for both both teams. Team that win increases. Team that lose decreases. But um, but that's it's still like it we didn't manipulate the team to win. So it, it's not exact, like it's an interesting pre-post, but it's not, it's, it's not like clear cut because, um, yeah. So, and other things like uh, sexual activity may increase with testosterone, but that also, but like not the other way around. So like you add, so sexual activity may drive testosterone increases but it doesn't, but testosterone increases don't seem to drive sexual activity. It's complicated and it's not just like T, like testosterone is this magical like man hormone because women have it too. It just, it's in higher levels. All right, so last, or no, almost last is cortisol. So cortisol is released in response to stress um, both physical and psycholo psychological. The goal is to like prepare the body for action. So stress is supposed to be linked to, you know, immediate things that need to be addressed. 
unfortunately, so if you have severe stress levels, so chronically high stress, so, or, or for people with severe stress, anxiety, and depression, as well as just, like, environmental stressors, so it's not just, or sustained anxiety because of the uncertainty in the world. Now, I, I don't have any um, current public health crisis um, data off the top of my head, but it seems to be chronically high in people with those extra stressors in their lives. Low levels, but this is probably more of an effect than a cause. It's probably not that cortisol levels are driving you to become severely stressed. It's probably the other way where s severe stress, anxiety, and depression are causing the cortisol levels. Um, this increases the risk of heart disease and may make this, this next little statement is really dubious. May make the brain smaller. I'm including it because it gets mentioned enough that I have to acknowledge that some people find like this. The literature on this is I'm not super compelled by it. But um, yeah, excuse me. We'll find out if my green coffee mug disappears or not. Okay, so low levels of it are associated with um, higher sensation seeking, higher levels of impulsivity, um, not following the rules of society, and can I help you choose? Do you want to come come say hello? Hi. Hello. We're talking about hormones. Mm -hmm. You, he's on a diet, so he's just desperate for anything that could maybe be food. Hi. Thank you. Maybe? Oh, okay. Um, I think he's trying to figure out where to sit. I'm, I'm make, trying to make some space for him. Do you want to sit? Sit, please? Okay. Um, where did he go? Hi. Okay. Please, can you, can you sit? Look at this nice, nice table space right here. Right here. Okay, well, uh, where were we? So lower levels of cortisol seem to be linked with higher levels of sensation seeking, increased levels of <laughs> impulsivity, um, not following the rules of society. And this m might be uh, due to abnormal responses to like the cortisol danger signals. Um, now, in addition to all of this, it also helps you sleep. It navigates, it, it it's a, uh, it's, it's linked to sleep cycles, as you can kind of see in some of the illustrations here. In morning, it's at your peak, like, as, and it slowly increases as you, like, wake in. Um, and then it slowly usually tapers down throughout the day. You might have some spikes based on stressors. And as, as your day goes on and on, it slowly dips, and that seems to help with... Um, to not the microphone. Oh, hey, what what do we want? I know what we want, but I can't. That was my mouth. All right. So yeah, this is gonna be our uh, enjoy. I'm gonna keep going because I got like three slides left. All right. So oxytocin. Uh, this this lives in the this released from the pituitary gland of the posterior lobe, or the posterior lobe of the pituitary gland. It has a role in mother-child bonding, as well as romantic attachment and sexual response. It tends to decrease fearfulness um, and facilitate approach behaviors among both humans and animals. Um, I imagine that what Chuki's getting right now is a nice dose of oxytocin because I'm his, like, mother figure. Hi. 
Like, yeah. I'm gonna try and make it so, like, you totally did this on purpose to illustrate. Ooh, he is shedding. Yeah. And so, like, getting, you know, attention and touch. I think he digs it. You may, most likely, will not be able to hear this. And even if I capture it on the, the mic, it'll likely get screened out when I do some, ooh, some audio filtering. But yeah, so it still it facilitates approach behaviors with that tendon befriend, um, and like there are oxytocin sprays, they don't really work. But uh, that's more it's getting okay. So here's the last little piece, the big five in the brain, and here's where I really, really, really encourage you to think about or using the big five to frame this whole unit just because it, it's a nice heuristic. Um, so we got two kind of big chunks. And also please look in the book for this because I, I don't want to like just read off a list of like extroversion is associated with the medial orbital uh, frontal cortex, conscientiousness, medial, medial blah, blah, middle frontal gyrus, et cetera, et cetera. Lots of stuff linked with neuroticism. Please like check it out. It's figure 8.4 in the book, which I have listed as a pool, uh, page 295, but the title of this is uh, Regions of the Brain Associated with Four of the Big Five, and the table right around here. So as you, as I've mentioned a couple of times, um, there are kind of like two mega factors um, that uh, kind of are in play here, so and those seem to be linked to various hormones. So stability is associated with serotonin, and plasticity is associated with dopamine. And so each of the traits, like each of the big five traits, have their own patterns of associations, but when you divide the big five up into those two, like, higher order factors, you, you get at least some kind of structure some kind of at least some it's the only way i can manage all the brain stuff because there's a lot there's a lot of pieces in here and in what i do and i do this with all my bit all my like personality research because like my training is in quantit is in like statistic and quantitative and behavior genetics um hi tube can oh okay we're just gonna lick my hand cool anyway uh, so, like, for me, it's really helpful to be able to have this framework just for all the different facts I know about the big, about personality and its links to stuff. So, yeah, each trait has its own patterns of behavior, but there seems to be a, an overall link between serotonin and stability and dopamine with plasticity. Okay, so the last little piece, oh, oh that's been, okay, thank goodness we didn't step on the keyboard. So uh, the last little piece here that's in the book, so I feel it's worth mentioning, is the cause and effect aspect here. The relationship between the brain and its environment works in both directions. It's not that the brain go like causes the body to do stuff or the body causes the brain to do stuff. Or like there it's it's not like a one-way street. They both interact with each other. They um and the uh, environment slash situation influences all of this as well. It's a complex system, and as much as the, I want to be able to distill it down into, yeah, brain cause you behavior. Behavior cause you to change environment. No, it's not that simple. If it were, it would have been like three slides, and we would have been done. Then I could spend more time on behavior genetics. Also, the squeaky chair not in yet. Um... So, but understanding the brain can help us understand behavior as well as use our understanding of behavior to also help us understand the brain. They work both ways. It's, it's not one or the other. It never is. And so this whole, art, like this mind-body divide that you'll hear about kind of in philosophy and sometimes it's thought about in psych. Yeah, no, it's, it's not a one-way street. It's not like we're floating heads who like... Are just sending instructions to our body. Mm -mm. Body talks back. So yeah. Um, but oh, one last comment that has 
only tangentially related. Power poses, garbage. Uh, it's this idea that you can just stand like Superman. Um, all right. So obviously, I, it's you put your uh, no no chance because this this uh, you you put your shoulder your hands on your hips and make this powerful pose. It doesn't change your neurochemistry. It does. It just it's placebo. It doesn't replicate. It doesn't change hormones. But that's it's not always like that. That one's kind of the exception. Yeah, most stuff works both ways. So yeah. Uh, thanks for watching. Uh, I will see you. Well, you'll see me in the next video. And uh, that's it for this module. Bye.